For today's story, we have the United States Court of Appeals from the District of Columbia for the case of Mozilla versus the FCC. This is a case dealing with internet regulation and the ability of states to regulate the internet by net neutrality or otherwise when the FCC is no longer doing so. So as you may remember, the FCC had previously had a net neutrality regulation, but they withdrew that regulation and some states have tried to impose it on their own. The FCC has tried to stop this and they, the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit has ruled that the FCC cannot stop it because the authority that they had, they gave up to the states, and so the states can do it because they are not preempted. So we're going to read this decision and see what it has to say about preemption doctrine as it relates to the Internet. So let's get started. In 2018, the Federal Communication Commission adopted an order classifying broadband Internet access services as information services under Title I of the Communication Act of 1934 as amended by Telecommunications Act of 1996. In doing so, the agency pursued a market-based light-touch policy for governing the Internet and departed from its 2015 order that had imposed utility-style regulation under Title II of the Act. Petitioners, an array of internet companies, nonprofits, state and local governments, and other entities bring a host of challenges to the 2019 order. We find their objections unconvincing for the most part, though we vacate one portion of the 2018 order and remand for further proceedings on three discrete points. The 2018 order and today's litigation represent yet another iteration of a long-running debate regarding the regulation of the internet. We rehearsed much of this complex history in the United States Telecom Association versus FCC, and we see no need to recapitulate here what was done so well and said so thoroughly there. In the interest of reader friendliness, though, we provide a brief review and certain highlights necessary to understand our opinion. As relevant here, the 1996 Telecommunication Act creates two potential classifications for broadband internet, telecommunication services under Title II of the Act and information services under Title I. These similar sounding terms carry considerable significance. Title II entails common carrier status and triggers an array of statutory restrictions and requirements. For example, Title II declares unlawful any change, charge, practice, classification, regulations as unjust or unreasonable. By contrast, information services are exempted from common carrier status and hence Title II regulation. An analogous set of classifications applies to mobile broadband. A com commercial mobile service is subject to commercial common carrier status, whereas a private mobile service is not. The Commission's authority under the Act includes classifying various services into the appropriate statutory categories. In the years since the Act's passage, the Commission has exercised its classification authority with some frequency. Initially in 1998, the Commission classified broadband over, line, over phone lines as a telecommunication service. Just four years later, though, the Commission determined that cable broadband was an information service, a choice the Supreme Court upheld in Brand X. The agency then applied a similar classification to wireland and wireless broadband. But the 2015 Commission took the view that broadband internet access is in fact a telecommunication service and the mobile broadband is a commercial mobile service. In USTA, this court upheld that classification as reflecting a reasonable interpretation of the statute under Chevron's second step. Once again, the Commission has switched its tactic. In 2017, the Commission issued a notice of proposed rulemaking seeking to revert to its pre-2015 position in In Re Restoring Internet Freedom and released on the final order at that issue in the case in 2018. The 2018 order accomplishes a number of objectives. First and foremost, it classifies broadband internet as an information service and mobile broadband as a private mobile service. Second, relying on Section 257 of the Act, located in Title II, but written so as to apply to Titles 1 through 6, the Commission adopts transparency rules and tend to ensure that consumers have adequate data about internet service providers' network practices. Third, the Commission undertakes a cough benefit analysis, concluding the benefits of the market-based light-touch regime for internet governance outweigh those of the common carrier regulation under Title II, resting heavily on the combination of transparency requirements imposed by the Commission under Section 257 with enforcement of existing antitrust and consumer protection laws. The Commission likewise finds the burdens of Title II order conduct rules exceeds their benefits. We uphold the 2018 order with two exceptions. First, the court concludes the commission has not shown the legal authority to issue its preemption directive, which would have barred states from imposing any rule or requirement the commission repealed or decided to refrain from imposing in the order that or is more stringent than the order. The court accordingly vacates that portion of the order. Second, we remand the order to the agency on three discrete issues. The order failed to examine the implications of its decision for public safety, 
The order does not sufficiently explain what reclassification will mean for regulation of poll attachments, and the agency did not adequately address petitioner's concern about the effects of broadband reclassification on the Life and Land program. So, long story short, the Court of Appeals says that if states want to impose net neutrality, they can, because the federal government's FCC gave up its ability to regulate and it gave up its preemption authority. So, although the FCC has said nationwide there is no net neutrality, individual states can say there's net neutrality, and several states have imposed net neutrality requirements, so that is a boon to those states. So, let's go on to the issue of preemption. Next, we'll turn specifically to the portion of the court's decision that deals with the preemption issue. Preemption is the issue where the federal government owns the field of something. They take over the entire field. And so when the federal government preempts, it precludes any state from regulating in that field. There's a general power of states to regulate, but when the federal government dominates the field, they can prevent states from regulating. However, they have to do so very explicitly. They have to take over that power very explicitly. And this decision is saying that the FCC gave up its power to preempt by causing this, the regulation that they did. So they basically undid their own power by regulating the way they did. So we're going to read a little bit about the preemption doctrine. Finally, the FCC argues that we should leave the preemption directive undisturbed because the principles of conflict preemption would lead to the same result. Any intuitive appeal this argument might have offered evaporated an oral argument when the commission confirmed what the preemptive directive's plain language bespeaks. It sweeps broader than ordinary conflict preemption. The necessary consequence of this position is that ordinary conflict preemption principles cannot salvage the preemption directive. Beyond that, the commission's conflict preemption argument tries to force a square peg into a round hole. Conflict preemption applies to state law that under the circumstances of a particular case stands as an obstacle to the accomplishment and execution of the full purposes and objectives of Congress, where that obstacle goes by the name of conflicting, contrary to, repugnance, difference, irreconcilability, inconsistency, violation, curtailment, interference, or the like. We have long recognized that whether a state regulation unavoidably conflicts with national interest is an issue incapable of resolution in the abstract, let alone in gross. Because a conflict preemption analysis involves a fact-intensive inquiry, it mandates deferential review until an actual preemption of specific state regulation occurs. Without the facts of any alleged conflict between us, we cannot begin to make a conflict preemption analysis in this case, let alone a category of the determination of any of all the forms of state regulation of interstate, interstate, in, intrastate broadband that would inevitably conflict with the 2018 order. Thank you, Naxari, for your donation. I watch all of your videos on demand and appreciate what you do. Thank you very much. I appreciate that you appreciate it. I appreciate that I'm helping things be understood and, you know, I like to teach and this is a good way for me to do it, right? So thank you for the $2 donation. It's very appreciated. The dissenting opinion for its part invents a brand new source of preemptive power that not even the commission claims. Always exciting. The power to preempt is said to derive from Chevron deference. Oh, Lord, have mercy. One of these days, I'm going to have to do a video just on Chevron deference and Brand X because I have so many thoughts on Chevron and Brand X. So many thoughts. Oh, man. One of these days, I really hope the Supreme Court overrules it. It drives me crazy. Carrying on. And the deferential ambiguity that permits the commission to classify broadband under Title I. In the dissenting opinion's view... That interpretive ambiguity alone spawns a power to preempt all that might with an express statutory grant of authority. Wow. So for those of you who are not keeping track, they say that even though there's a statute, or in this case, not a statute, there is not a statute that says they can preempt. They say that Chevron deference gives them the authority to invent preemption from nowhere. From nowhere. Man. And you know what's really sad about that line of argument? It's actually not that ridiculous a line of argument. That's how far Chevron deference goes. Chevron and Brand X deference, Brand X deference has gone to levels that are, are completely absurd. So as absurd as this line of argument may seem, even though there's no statute that says we can do it, we can just invent it, Chevron kind of says they might be right. That's how absurd Chevron is. Word of mercy. First, this asserted legal basis for your preemption is not before us. The 2018 ordered two and only two sources of authority for the preemption directive, the impossibility exception and the federal policy of non-regulation for information services. 
It did not advance Chevron Step 2 as a source of preemption authority, so it cannot do so for the first time here. The Commission's brief here hewed to the 2018 order, advancing the two independent bases of authority, plus ordinary principles of conflict preemption. Once again, the dissenting opinion's Chevron Step 2 theory is not there, so it is forfeited. You lost it, sir. Good day, sir. Of course, the Commission alluded to its Chevron Step 2 interpretation in explaining its policy reasons for design categorical preemption, but nowhere does it argue what the dissenting opinion does, that Chevron interpretation ambiguity provides an affirmative source of legal authority to preempt state laws. And I would personally argue that it does not exist. If you want to preempt the field, Congress can do it. The key word in that sentence being Congress. Congress does things by passing law. Agencies cannot just from thin air say that we can preempt the field without statutory authority. So, you know, I'm glad that there's some limits to the Chevron doctrine, doctrine after all. Second, the dissenting opinion fails to explain how the commission's interpretive authority under Chevron to classify broadband as a Title I information service could do away with the sin qua non for agency preemption, a congressional delegation of authority either to preempt or to regulate. Sin qua non means that which without basically means something that is essential to. So it just means essential, if you want to put it in non-Latin. Congress expressly fenced off from the Commission's reach or regulatory intrastate matters, including matters in connection with intrastate services. It is also Congress that chooses to house affirmative regulatory authority in Titles 2, II, 3, and 6, and not Title 1. So the FCC has some affirmative regulatory authority according to laws that again, Congress passed, they have affirmative regulatory authority in Titles 2, 3, and 6. So before, when they regulated this under Title 2 and said there was this thing called net neutrality, they could do that because Congress said you had the authority to regulate in that area. But then they switched it to Title 1 and they said, oh, now it's just an information service. And Congress said, well, if it's Title 1, you don't have affirmative regulatory authority. And the FCC says, yes, we do, because Chevron. And finally, a court said, no, you don't. So I'm once again glad there's a limit somewhere. And it's Congress to which the Constitution assigns the power to set the meets and bounds of agency authority. Yeah, that's what I thought when I learned from, uh, you know, I'm just a bill. I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Congress makes laws. That's kind of what I learned. Especially when an agency's authority would otherwise tramp on the power of states to act within their own borders. So to work here, the agency's interpretive authority would have to trump Congress's calibrated assessment of regulatory authority in the Communications Act. In other words, for FCC, for you to win, your power would have to be greater than Congress's. That's not happening. Yeah, I'm with you, even evil coleslaw. The fact, the very fact they switched back to Title I is what torpedoed the whole line of argument does make me smile. It's like, you're, it's basically the too clever by half problem. You know, when you're too clever by half, it's like, we're going to do this, and it comes with all these consequences you didn't see. Yeah. Now, you one would think that the FCC's lawyers, general counsel, would have, you know, brought that to their attention. But they were probably in such a rush to strip out the Title II authority, they just didn't pay attention to it. I bet one of their lawyers did bring it to their attention. I bet they ignored it. But that cannot be right. Well, that's what I thought. No matter how desirous of protecting their policy judgments, agency officials cannot invest themselves with power that Congress has not conferred. Right. And nothing in Chevron rewrites or erases that plain statutory text. The dissenting opinion invokes two cases discussing implied preemption arising from different agencies' decisions to forego regulation under different statutory schemes. It first cites Arkansas Electric Cooperative versus Arkansas Public Service Commission, in which the Supreme Court observed that a federal decision to forego regulation in a given authority may imply an authoritative de federal determination that the area is best to be unregulated. The court went on to conclude that the relevant statute did not in fact imply such a determination, and so state regulation issue was not preempted. At best, Arkansas Electric sets up one version of the question, but it gets the dissent no closer to its preferred answer, that here, Congress delegated to the commission the authority to give sweeping preemptive effect to whatever policy determination underlay a Chevron Step 2 interpretation of offer. In a second case, Ray versus Atlantic, the Supreme Court described the preemptive impact implied by the failure of federal officials affirmatively to exercise their full authority under the statute that the court had already recognized as delegating regulatory power to the agencies. Those cases do nothing to empower the commission to engage in express preemption in the 2018 order. See oral argument. Commission. 
quote, no, Your Honor, it's express preemption. In either case was the source or existence of statutory authority for the agency to preempt state regulation at issue, nor do those cases speak to a statutory scheme in which Congress expressly marketed out a regulatory role for states that the federal agency had attempted to surplant. So again, when Congress set this thing up, they set it up with some power to the federal government and some other things where the state could regulate. So they said, as to these issues, these are state issues. As to these issues, these are federal issues. These are the kind of things that Congress gets to do. And if they want to preempt the field, they can do so if they do so clearly. They said, for Title II, we are preempting the field. If it's Title II communication, we're preempting the field so we can have uniform regulation. But information services states that you, you can deal with that. We don't want a piece of that. So, yeah. If Congress wanted Title I to vest the commission with some sort of dormant commerce clause-like power to negate state statutory and sovereign authority just by washing its hand of its own regulatory authority, Congress could have said so, but they didn't. They said the opposite of those things. Third, the dissenting opinion's effort to discern Congress's delegation of preemption authority in Chevron and Brand X does not work either. The dissenting opinion acknowledges this theory of Chevron preempted authority derives entirely from the ambiguity in the word offer, a word that's buried in a definitional section in a non-regulatory part of the statute. So the let's just let's just take pause that the FCC is trying to gain all its authority to do this from one single word in a definition section. All the FCC's regulation that they're trying to do now with preemption all comes down to literally one word, the word offer. That's the magic word, according to the FCC. From that word alone, they have all the power to preempt the field because of offer. It's magic. The court disagrees, and so do I. Who cares what Congress says? We have Chevron. I'm with you, evil, evil trouble one. Man, that seems to be the, the, the mode of things. The word offer means that we, we have deference. Okay, no you don't, go away. To be sure, Chevron and Brand X together confirm the commission has interpretive discretion to classify broadband as either an information service or a telecommunication service. Congress, in other words, granted an interpretive statutory fork in the road and gave the commission the authority to choose the path. But the commission's power to choose one regulatory destination or the other does not carry with it the option to mix and match its favorite parts of both. That's a nice bit of burn. The dissenting opinion's deference, defense of the preemption directive, makes the mistake of collapsing the distinction between the commission's authority to make a threshold classification decision and the authority to issue affirmative and state-displacing legal commands within the bounds of the classification scheme the commission has selected here, Title I. The agency's power to do the former says nothing about its authority to do the latter. Chevron, after all, is not a magic wand that invests agency with regulatory power beyond what their author authorizing statutes provide. I, I just want to like have that tattooed on me. That's such a, such a good line. It's like I just want to take that line and just stamp it like over and over again on like every legal brief from here to the end of the world. I don't even care what the key, the case is. I don't care if somehow I get involved in a murder case. I'm just quoting this line. I don't know how it's relevant. I'm throwing it in there somewhere. Chevron, after all, is not a magic wand that invests agency with regulatory power beyond what their authorizing statutes provide. Amazing concepts at work here, folks. Wow. Who would have thought Congress gets to decide what laws are, not agencies? That's what I thought. Instead, the point of Chevron was simply to draw lines between the courts and administrative agencies respective to their roles in interpreting ambiguous statutes. The dissenting opinion's theory of Chevron preemption, in other words, takes the discretion to decide which definition best fits a real-world communication service and attempts to turn that into a subsidiary judgment into a license to reorder the entire statutory scheme to enforce an overarching nationwide regime that enforces its policy preference underlying the designation choice. Nothing in Chevron goes that far, and doing here so would turn every exercise of Chevron Step 2 interpretation into a bureaucratic blunderbuss. That's a great word right there. Bureaucratic blunderbuss. For those of you who don't know what a blunderbuss is, it's a very antique kind of shotgun. It was a very inaccurate shotgun. So it just basically scatters things everywhere. That's a great use of word. Doing so here would interpret turn every exercise of Chevron Step 2 interpretation into a bureaucratic blunderbuss capable of demolishing state laws across the nation anytime the agency fears that state regulation might intrude on regulatory or deregulation ethos. Wow, that's 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 a pretty strong language to be. That's wow, that's that's spicy language. I, I like it. The Supreme Court has made very clear that Chevron does not have that much muscle. 
Congress, the court has explained, does not alter the fundamental details of a regulatory scheme, let alone dip so heavily on the balance of powers between the federal government and the states in vague terms or ancillary provisions. It does not want, might say, hide elephants in mouth holes, mouse holes. Yes, if they're going to preempt, they have to be pretty explicit about it. They don't like do it subtly. They don't do it in one magic word of offer. Anyhow, that's, that's, that's kind of casual for a court just to say anyhow, but that's what it says. Anyhow, the argument that the commission needs to save its classification decision from becoming meaningless still does not work. If a commission can explain how a state practice actually undermines the 2018 order, then it can invoke conflict preemption. If it cannot make that showing, then presumably the two regulations can coexist as the FCC Act envisions. What matters for present purposes is that on this record, the commission has made no showing that wiping out all state or local requirements that are inconsistent with the order of approach is necessary to give its reclassification effect. And binding Supreme Court precedent says that mere worries that policy will be frustrated by jurisdictional tensions inherent in the Federal Communications Act does not preempt, create preemption authority. It's unclear what tensions they're referring to since internet services of these kinds typically run within state lines. So, whatever. For those same reasons, the dissenting opinion's concern that the most draconian state policy trumps all else is a straw man. In vacating the preemption directive, we do not consider whether the remaining portions of the 2018 order have preemptive effect on their principles of conflict preemption or anything implied by the preemption doctrine. Much like the dissenting opinion effort to wring out of the Arkansas Electric and Ray a source of preemption authority, the dissenting opinion's suggestion that the court's decision leaves no room for an implied preemption confuses the scope of the commission's authority to expressly preempt with its potential implied preemptive effect of the regulatory choices the commission's made that are within its authority. So yes, you get to choose, but you're bound by those choices. You made your choices, lie in that bed, sir. Fourth, the dissenting opinion's reliance on the Eighth Circuit's opinion in Minnesota Public Utilities Commission versus FCC is misplaced. That opinion enumerates the discrete question it purports to answer, none of which was whether Congress delegated to the commission the authority to preempt. The Eighth Circuit decided only whether the commission's order was arbitrary and capricious because it determined it was impractical or impossible to separate the intrastate components of voice over IP service from the interstate components or because it would determine state regulation of voice over IP conflicts with federal regulatory policies. This set of inquiries does not resolve the purely legal question of the sources of commission's authority, asserted preemption authority here. The dissenting opinion concedes the point. The dissenting opinion acknowledges that legal authority was not formally at issue. The dissent nevertheless suggests that the Eighth Circuit's decision upholding as neither arbitrary nor capricious the commission's finding of facts essential for application of the impossibility exception implies that had the court actually considered the question of whether the commission had the legal authority, it would have disagreed with us. But the Eighth Circuit's silence on that question leaves us with nothing to answer. Yeah, that's a bit of a strange thing to say. Like, if the Eighth Circuit had reached this question, they would have reached this conclusion. It's a bit of a bit of a logistical reach, but okay. At bottom, the commission lacked the legal authority to categorically abolish all 50 states' statutorily conferred authority to regulate intrastate communications. For that reason, we vacate the preemption directive. And because no particular state law is an issue in this case, and the commission makes no provision-specific arguments, it would be wholly premature for us to pass on the preemptive effect under conflict or other recognized preemption principles of remaining portions of the order. In other words, states, you go on, on and have your net neutrality doctrine in your states, and the federal government can bite it. Failure to adequately consider the 2018's order impact on public safety, poll attachment regulation, and lifeline program, we decline to vacate the order in its entirety. When deciding whether to vacate order, courts are to consider the seriousness of the deficiencies and the disruptive consequences of an interim change. Here, the factors wave in favor of remand without vacating. First, the commission may well be able to address on remand the issues it failed to adequately consider. Good luck with that. But because the commission's preemption directive, see the 2018 order, lies beyond its authority, we vacate that portion of the order, purporting to preempt any state or local requirements that are inconsistent with the deregulation approach. So yes, commission, you can take another stab at these other things, but as to your preemption authority, over. For these reasons, the petition to review is granted in part and denied in part. So ordered. Oh, so beautiful.